So uh, let's go into a couple of just working definitions as we go into this presentation. Uh, what are the scams and who are the spies? What do you have to be wary of online? Uh, scams, generally speaking, are when you're taken advantage of or when you're tricked into handing over something valuable, such as private information, actual money, <laughs> or other valuable data. Um, and then the spies, it's... Uh, the working definition that I'm using for spies online is any person or computer program that is sneakily invading your digital privacy. Uh, yeah, and so those two things often co-mingle in different ways online, uh, but it's worth sort of thinking about the adversaries that you might face when existing online. And digital privacy we're talking a lot about, uh, I like to think of it as your right to control your data. Um, it's your ability, your um, autonomy to restrict that data, who gets it, how it's shared, where it's stored, who else sees it, etc. So as we talk about scams or things that are invasive to your privacy, uh, I think it's important to think of them as these opportunistic events. Um, they can appear in your email, uh, over the phone, uh, in text messages, or in your browser, like on websites that you visit. Uh, they're all over the digital and virtual landscape, and they're always designed to lure you in in some way, and they appear harmless. They're often preying on emotional impulses, uh, getting you to trust them and like them, or making you think that something bad is going to happen unless you act and you click on some creepy link or something. So speaking of which, uh, clicking on creepy links, uh, a type of scam that often takes place is something we call phishing. And that's a uh, phishing with a PH. Uh, it's a type of scam where the attacker uh, sends a message or an email or passes along some link to you that looks innocent, but is actually malicious. Um, these schemes are often used to distribute um, malware or malicious software or to steal valuable data. And it's usually crafted to appear like it's coming from someone that you might already know or that you trust or just a reputable business. Um, and these can come in all sorts of places, uh, right? Like I said, you know, it, it could be in a phone text message, it could be in an email, or it could be on a social media message on a website. And as I mentioned in the last slide, uh, those phishing schemes can be a way to distribute malware. Now, malware, as I said, is a type of malicious software. It's a computer program that causes you or your computer harm. And there's all sorts of different uh, species and types of malware that can exist online or offline, just on a computer. <laughs> um, but they uh, sometimes the damage that they cause can be very visible. It can make your computer crash or um, it will encrypt all of your files and make them inaccessible to you. Uh, or does something just very clearly wrong with your computer. But other times it can be totally secret and covert operating behind the scenes without you even knowing that it's there, but it's secretly stealing all of your data. Uh, a lot of different types of malware can be self-replicating. Uh, they can be able to avoid detection. Uh, they're often capable of mutating and, and evolving depending on the environments that they're in. Uh, they can be really scary. You know, it's a cat and mouse game often with antivirus softwares and malware developers. So um, as I painted kind of a scary uh, landscape of the, uh, the, the internet world we all exist in, full of malware and phishing schemes and attackers and hackers, it can seem pretty daunting to uh, protect yourself. But uh, that's, that's what I want to dispel here. Uh, there are a lot of pretty easy things you can do now to up your privacy and security. 
and um, the vast majority of uh, privacy and security incidents that take place online um, are preventable for uh, the average citizen in the virtual realm. So let's cover a few of those. Uh, one good thing to uh, keep in your back pocket, uh, especially to avoid scams, uh, is how to spot phishing in the wild. Um, as I mentioned, sometimes these phishing schemes are specifically crafted to prey on emotions. So I want you to be able to look out for any sort of act now or beware um, messaging that comes in these, uh, that comes in like messages that you receive. Uh, it could be something like a good thing, like you've won a prize, but you only have 24 hours to, um, to claim your prize. So you have to click this link now. Uh, when secretly that link is, you know, doing something uh, bad. <laughs> uh, or it could be something like uh, the, the, the order that you've placed, or um, there's, a, there's a police warrant out for your arrest. And if you, don't, if you don't act now and click this link or register this account, then all is lost. Uh, if you sense that there's kind of that emotional praying happening and, uh, you know, an uh, uh, unexpected message that you've received, take a moment to investigate it further before you fall prey to it. Um, always avoid clicking on links or opening attachments in unexpected messages. Uh, if it appears to be coming from someone that you trust, double check with that person that they meant to send it to you. Um, it's a good thing to do. They, they will probably appreciate that because they know that you're taking your security seriously and uh, and that can also be their security too. And if you're not sure who the sender uh, is or if you know them or not, um, just be free to double check with them. And I, I mean, in this case, like with businesses or um, just other individuals that maybe you know on a professional level or something, reach out to them through another method. You can contact the business directly or ask to speak over LinkedIn or um, another social media account you might have. Just in general, you want to double check that the purported sender is who you think they are. So on the, uh, on the screen right now, uh, visible on the screen, I've attached a screenshot of a, um, the headers for an email that was sent to someone. And in the from line of who, the, who is the sender of the email, it says it's from the Gates Foundation. And if you look closely, the email address is from info at gatesfoundation.org. At first glance, it seems legitimate. It's just info at gatesfoundation.org. But if you look closely, the word uh, foundation and that address is actually spelled wrong. And so in this case, they're actually hoping that you just glance at it quickly uh, and you don't, you don't read the full, uh, the full email address of the sender uh, because it looks legitimate at first glance. And in the subject line, it says important notice to um, BFF. Uh, and that important notice most likely uh, in the body of the email, it says something like, uh, maybe you're facing a lawsuit from the Gates Foundation and you have to respond now or else you'll be taken to court. Um, but if you look closely, you know, it's, it's spelled wrong. It's, it's not actually Bill Gates or whoever trying to contact you. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about tracking. Uh, when I'm talking about tracking here, I mean web tracking. Uh, uh, and that's tracking both on your phone or on your computer, just anywhere that you're accessing uh, the web, the World Wide Web, the internet. <laughs> uh, there is an entire industry online designed to track you. Uh, it tracks what you do, um, who you know, where you're going, what you're buying, uh, how you're behaving on websites, the type of software that you have installed, the browser that you're using, um, where you're located, uh, what versions of operating system you're on, etc. It can collect a lot about you. And uh, this industry is designed to collect that and sell it. Uh, it's creepy. <laughs> it's very privacy invasive. Unfortunately, it's also entirely legal. Um, trackers are hidden in advertisements on web pages, uh, but they're also just embedded on those websites 
secretly, totally invisible to you, um, under the hood on the website. These invisible, completely legal things are able to gather information about you. And it gathers information, not just on the one website that you're on, but on all of the websites that you visit. Uh, and the same trackers can be placed all over. And so you can imagine that that information snowballs and just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the uh, portrait of you that it begins to uh, portray is really scarily accurate. And that information, that portrait that they've gathered uh, is then sold to whoever wants it, anyone that's got the money to buy it. And this is all happening behind the scenes without you knowing that it's happening. Um, so when you visit a website and you get an advertisement that is like really uh, creepily accurate, like say you've been thinking about and kind of like doing a little bit of cursory web searching throughout the last week or so about buying a new rug. And then you go on to a random website and suddenly you're just being bombarded with all of these advertisements for rugs. Um, that's because of this. <laughs> it's because of advertisers that are um, buying that data that is being collected from web trackers and then making advertisements designed for you, hoping that you'll uh, click on their links and buy their products. And sometimes you might actually want that, right? Like, Sometimes I like having a targeted advertisement because it might introduce me to something that um, I didn't know existed, like a, a cool product that I wanna buy. But the point is you should always have the option, you should always have the ability to opt into that. Um, they should ask you before collecting that data, right? So um, in the industry, uh, uh, we call this sort of uh, tracking ability uh, your fingerprint, like your unique fingerprint online. And so we've developed a tool at EFF called Cover Your Tracks. Um, it is a uh, browser tool, it's a website that uh, is used to determine your unique fingerprint ability online. Uh, Really what that means is it's running all of these different algorithms and special scripts behind the scenes that um, determine how easy it is to uniquely identify you as a user as opposed to any other random user online. And uh, that paints a pretty good uh, 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 way of marking how these advertisers or these trackers online are able to do the same thing. Now, this tool is really cool because um, it can give you like a basic sort of score on uh, how uniquely identifiable you are, but also it gets pretty in depth in describing some of the things if you want to go in depth with it about the actual uh, technical things that it's able to um, use to identify you and to make a unique portrait of you. And so in that way, you can pick and choose, choose the right tools to uh, um, mitigate the problems that maybe this, this has uncovered for you. But it itself doesn't protect you from those trackers. But don't worry, we've developed a tool for that. Um, there's another tool called Privacy Badger. And it's also developed by uh, us at EFF. I'm one of the developers for the project. Um, it is a browser extension, it's a plugin, uh, which is like a piece of software that you install on your browser. So on your uh, Firefox or Chrome or Opera, uh, Microsoft Edge, whatever browser you're using, uh, as long as they support this type of extension. Uh, this runs in the background to identify those trackers on the websites that you visit. Uh, so it's working sort of in the same invisible layer. Uh, of the websites and it and it identifies trackers based on that creepy tracking behavior, the fingerprint stuff that um, that cover your tracks uh, is able to look at. And it determines what is a tracker and what isn't, and then it blocks them. And so it blocks them across all those different websites that you're visiting. Uh, it's really cool because it's a install and forget kind of tool that works behind the scenes. And it's not an ad blocker, 
but um, a positive sort of side effect of it is that it acts kind of like an ad blocker sometimes because a lot of these advertisements have those trackers built into them. And so they get blocked by Privacy Badger. Okay, so um, another uh, tactic or tool that you can use to up your security and privacy is multi-factor authentication. Um, I hope you've heard of this, but don't worry if you haven't. It's a pretty easy concept to grasp. Um, it is when you're asked by a website or an account that you hold to provide another form of verification, uh, besides just username and password to log in, that's multi-factor authentication or uh, sometimes also called two-factor authentication, 2FA. Um, on the screen, I have provided a screenshot of uh, the menu on Twitter uh, for when you uh, are configuring your Twitter account and turning on two-factor authentication here. Uh, this is a really common pattern that they will put two-factor authentication under a sort of security menu that's under like your settings. Um, sometimes it's under privacy, but usually it's under security. Uh, and uh, it's not usually turned on by default with the types of accounts that you're holding. So with any of the accounts that you regularly use, you should definitely go into the security menu that they have and turn it on. It's a very, very common uh, security tool that these platforms have, and it's super useful. Um, the types of verification that they will provide for you um, to use when you log in are things like uh, codes that will be passed along in a phone text message or an email sent to you, or sometimes there are special apps that are made just for this purpose. Um, like uh, Google makes one that's an authenticator app. Uh, there's another one called Authy. Or uh, if you don't want to rely on a piece of software, you could even get a little piece of uh, like a little physical tool called a YubiKey uh, to uh, do the, the, the steps involved of multi-factor authentication when you're logging into a website or account that you own. Um, the point being, uh, turn it on for all of the accounts that you have, uh, because this, this particular tactic uh, protects you from having any of your accounts hijacked. So if somebody is specifically targeting you, or if uh, an account that you have somewhere on a platform, if that platform is uh, hacked or there's a breach of some kind, and all of the credentials for all of the users on that, um, on that platform are spilled to the public, um, you can rest assured that nobody's going to log into your account because you have a good multi-factor authentication set up on it. Okay, so um, another tactic to uh, use upping your security uh, is backups. Um, backing up your data, uh, this is the practice of taking a snapshot of the entire contents of your computer and uh, like all of the files, all of the uh, drives, everything on your computer at the moment and saving it in the event that your data is lost or tampered with. Um, a lot of the times, depending on the operating systems that we use, uh, it's turned on by default. Thankfully, that's a, uh, a good step forward that operating systems have made over the years. Uh, in Windows, uh, this type of program is called file history, uh, and that takes care of that for you. Uh, if you're an Apple user and you're on Mac OS, uh, the same type of program is called Time Machine. Uh, if you're not sure that they're turned on or not, uh, it's worth looking for that program, whichever you use in your operating system and looking at the little slider or switch or whatever way that it uh, tells you that it's currently enabled. Now, as I mentioned, uh, backups are just a snapshot, right? It's just like a moment in time of um, your computer and the files on it. So it's something that you have to keep up. It's a routine. Um, uh, but thankfully, those uh, programs uh, 
can be scheduled to do it like once a week or sometimes once a day or once a month, depending on how you want to do it. Uh, they run behind the scenes, so I like to do them quite often. Uh, and this particular tactic, backing up, uh, is especially useful if you're ever targeted with something called ransomware, which is a type of malware, remember malicious software, uh, that holds your data hostage. Um, it will uh, plant itself onto your machine and it encrypts or scrambles all of your data and makes it inaccessible to you. And it will hold it ransom until you pay whoever some amount of money to get access back. But if you have good backups saved and they're saved um, you know, onto the cloud or uh, in some other place that is not on your computer, uh, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, if that happens, hoping it doesn't, uh, if you take the other steps described here, it's a lot less likely to happen, uh, you'll still be okay because you'll have a pretty recent snapshot of all of the things that were on your computer before. Okay, <laughs> um, another uh, good practice to keep uh, in upping your privacy and security online are passwords, keeping strong passwords. Uh, a good rule to have in all of your accounts is that you should have long, unique, and difficult to guess passwords for every account that you use. Uh, every single one needs its own unique password. And when I say long, I mean like 14 plus characters is a good minimum to go with um, because it's not, uh, uh, speaking from a sort of like hacker point of view, uh, it's not too difficult to get uh, the like encrypted or scrambled versions of passwords. And with um, uh, types of uh, like password cracking software or decrypting software, it's actually not too difficult to decrypt or unscramble those passwords if they're like up to 13 characters. Uh, it, it can be kind of easy sometimes. And especially if they're easier to guess, um, you should use passwords that aren't um, uh, easy to guess based on who you are or the account that it's used for or like the, the season or the year that you're in. Um, you'd be amazed how often people use something like password summer 2021 for an account. And it's like, well, okay, maybe that's a long password but it's actually kind of easy to guess because we're moving into summer, it's 2021 and it's a password. So uh, you might think uh, having a unique long password for every single account that you use uh, would make it really, really difficult to remember all of them, right? Uh, you wouldn't be wrong. It would be difficult to do that. Thankfully, there's a tool for that. Um, there are things called password managers. These are uh, tools that can encrypt or scramble your passwords and store them all into a single place that you access with a main password. So all you have to do is remember one password. And um, when you're using something like a password manager in tandem with multi-factor authentication uh, on your accounts, it protects your accounts from being hijacked, as I mentioned. Um, uh, these password managers are super handy too sometimes uh, in that you can use them across different devices. You can use them um, depending on the one that you choose. You can, you, you can have the same one on your phone, on your computer, on another computer. Uh, there can be a browser plugin or extension for it that is directly on your browser. So you just have to click a little button and it will automatically fill it for you. Uh, they're really good and they're really convenient. Sometimes they do cost money. Uh, there are some free versions. Either way, it's definitely worth looking into. It, they're super handy, they'll make your life easier and they raise your privacy and security up a whole bunch. Okay, so <laughs> I just covered a lot there. Um, those are a lot of like tools and, and um, tips and tactics you can use to, uh, to 
raise the threshold of your privacy and security online. Uh, but one thing I always like to mention in these types of presentations or uh, trainings is that digital privacy and security is a group effort. Uh, it's, a, it's a shared practice really, because this is a social world we live in. Um, we interact with so many different people. Uh, so getting help from the people that you know and trust uh, will do wonders for you. Uh, these things can be difficult to talk about. So making digital privacy and security uh, a priority to talk about with your loved ones, it not only makes these things easier to accomplish, but you can get their help and their insight onto raising your own privacy and security, but also it actually increases the privacy and security overall for you and your community. Um, I think of it as like a, a sort of like a principle of networking uh, in that, well, at least in like the security world, uh, in, in networking, when you have a node or like a, a, a person on a network uh, of a bunch of different people around in a network, if there's one person that uh, is compromised in any sort of way, or there's an unwanted uh, security incident on that node, um, it could implicate all the other nodes on the network. So you want to make sure that the people in your network, your loved ones, also have good privacy and security. And so it's worth, you know, talking to each other, setting good standards for each other on how, uh, how you share data about each other, um, the types of security protocols you have in place, and you know who you can turn to in the uh, case of an unwanted incident online.